slash L-A-C-E-S. Now I'm excited to introduce our two speakers. Jennifer Ng is an associate landscape architect at KMDG. She defines successful and inspiring designs as those that speak equally to placemaking and placekeeping. The consistent theme in her project is to create a sense of home and joy. She co-founded Design Connect, a nonprofit with Cornell University that brings pro bono interdisciplinary design and planning services to small towns in upstate New York. Prior to joining KMDG, she worked with Sasaki, CMG Landscape Architecture, and Hargreaves Associates. Jennifer graduated from Cornell in 2008. Elaine Limer is a senior planner at Sasaki who is passionate about planning as a process. Across a range of projects, from civic parks to large-scale land use planning, she sees planning as a way to build long-lasting community strength. She's a Californian who has been in New England for the last decade. Prior to being a planner, she worked as a community organizer working with a national nonprofit addressing human trafficking. Informed by this experience, her approach to planning prioritizes ways to connect people to methods of change appropriate to their context and capacity. Today, they're presenting their talk on breaking down the Zoom barrier, alternatives to community engagement during COVID. Welcome, Jennifer and Elaine. Hi, everyone. Um, I am joined by yard work right next to me. So if you hear what sounds like a giant motor, there is one right there. So um, I'm sorry about that if you hear that. Um, let's see. I'm trying to share and it is saying, who can share? Um, can I share? Yes, you should be able to. Oh dear, I probably should have tried this earlier. Um, I cannot share. Matt, can you help me with that? Sure, let's... Uh... I think we have a copy somewhere. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay. All right. Everyone can see that, Elaine and Cynthia. All right. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, they want to go. In, there you go. There you go. Uh, graduated from Cornell in 2008 with my bachelor's degree. And um, in 2009, I co-founded Design Connect with my then boyfriend, now husband. Um, and for those of you who um, aren't from Cornell, uh, Design Connect is a student organization, multidisciplinary, that invites architects, landscape architects, and planners to provide pro bono design services for small towns in upstate New York. And what that allows the small town to do is to then apply for grants and actually seriously pursue their project idea. Um, so the image in the middle is our first community meeting. And that was um, so exciting as somebody who had freshly graduated, so exciting for the students. And it was one of those moments that really does define what you wanna do with your career. Um, the stats on the right is where we were at our five year mark. Uh, so within five years, we had logged 8,000 volunteer hours and worked with 290 students. And it is so exciting to see Design Connect in year 12. Um, and it's just a, a real joy to see students continue to work on it. So since Cornell, I went to Hargraves in New York. I worked on the Denver Union Station. Then I moved to San Francisco where I was at CMG where I worked on Kersey Field, which is a national park um, with the National Park Conservancy and also Willy Wu Wong Playground in San Francisco's Chinatown and then Lakeview with Elaine and uh, Dennis who I, I think is in the audience right now. Um, and now Matt Klopp for Martin Design Group. We are a landscape architecture firm based in Boston. Um, and we really do work in sort of that middle zone between landscape, architecture, infrastructure, and urban design. 
And our work is based on the site's historic and cultural context and using that as the drivers uh, for contemporary narrative. Uh, the firm was founded by Kaki Martin and Mark Klopfer, and they were working at Hargraves in the Cambridge office, um, working nationally and internationally, and they got this small project, the Condor Street Urban Wild in East Boston, and it changed everything for them, and they both started to think about what a local practice uh, would mean to them. And they started Klopfer Martin Design Group in 2006, 2007. And right now we are a small group. We're 13 uh, landscape architects, architects, and artists. And we're growing really fast right now. And it's just such an exciting, um, exciting time to be at the firm. So a little bit about our design process. It usually starts with research and in, um, some sort of inspiration. And that the work is usually always rooted in history and people. And, we really do try to use the site's ecological and cultural context as the drivers for design. Um, then there's a stage where we engage and invite as many people to the design table as who want to be at the table and really trying to facilitate a design process um, that enables creative and local expression and grounds the work in the place and the people. Um, we work then to test those ideas and the, that sort of inspiration against technical realities and um, taking those sort of elegance and the charm and the excitement and um, making sure that that gets applied across all scales. So the overall experience and then those individual details. And then building, it's really important to us to build the project and that uh, the community that worked hard to contribute ideas to us also gets to experience the place. So just a little bit about our values and the type of work that we do. Um, live where you work, work where you live. Um, it's important to us that all staff be able to uh, visit the site during the design process and then equally importantly, be able to visit the site after the project is complete from a post-occupancy standpoint but also um, you know, to just enjoy the work, to enjoy the work as if uh, you, know, you were a resident of that place. To find beauty through history and culture and that history and culture should find themselves um, through the design language, through the form, through the layout, and also through the programming and that um, when you do have signage, the signage is something that is tactile and that in, um, improves the experience rather than something that you just see and walk by. <clears throat> that we challenge the paradigm of play and that play is something that is more than just for uh, kids between the ages of five and 12 and it's more than equipment play, it is spontaneous. Um, it is about fitness, it's sensory, it's constructive and it's um, about a sense of adventure. That we integrate resilient strategies throughout the project and that resiliency is not a coastal issue, it's also an inland issue too. It's not just about sea level rise, it's about how we handle our storm surges, how we think about stormwater management and how we support and supplement our historic urban canopies with additional trees that we do more with less. A lot of our work is publicly funded and that means that it's tax dollars that are creating the funds for our projects and, and that really does mean something to us and how can we reframe the ordinary into something that is extraordinary. And that we embrace public life. So this is Kennedy Plaza in Providence. It is a bus depot and um, how can you think about the plaza as a place that's for pedestrians um, and refocus um, the plaza and the energy on people rather than on buses? So it works in the everyday and then it also works for moments of joy and moments for safe democratic protest. So I'm going to walk you through a case study. This is a project that we're currently working on. This is Grove Hall Park. 
um, in the Grove Hall neighborhood, right on the edge between Dorchester and Roxbury. And we're working on this with uh, Boston Parks and Recreation and then Trust for Public Land is our nonprofit community uh, partner. So we joined this project in June, um, right at the height of the pandemic. So uh, playgrounds were closed and what we know as public recreation was closed, but we all knew that public space was becoming more and more important. And it was about a week after the killing of George Floyd. So this is a protest at Franklin Park, um, which is a few blocks away from our site. And we couldn't, we, we, we had to join this project and like really recognize what was happening in our world and that design couldn't be this like perfect little bubble anymore. It had to be something that was really addressing what was happening. And so just some stats for the Grove Hall that have kind of helped to inform what the engagement engagement strategy is going to be. So over 90% of Grove Hall identifies as Black or Hispanic. And we know that different ethnic groups, um, different cultures have different priorities with their open space. And so that is important when we think about um, the types of conversations we wanna have. Um, over 15% of the households in Grove Hall are linguistically isolated, which means that no one over age 14 speaks English fluently. Um, and the primary languages in Grove Hall are English, Spanish, and Cape Verdean Creole. Um, and what that means is that engagement can't be, um, you know, very verbally oriented. It needs to be something that's more graphic. It needs to be simple and clear and easily interpreted. Uh, there's a higher population, higher, um, there's 37 percent of the population lives below poverty line, which kind of implies to us that internet may not be as consistently accessible as it is in other parts of the city. Uh, there's a higher population of kids under 19 that live here, and one of the things that COVID has really taught us is that teenagers need a place to be outside um, that is theirs just as much as you know, a kid from the ages of two to five needs a tot lot, teenagers need a space as well. And that there's a lower than average uh, number of seniors in the neighborhood. But that's a little bit deceptive because we've realized there is a senior center across um, the street. And that senior center actually acts as a very active resource for seniors in the greater Roxbury and Dorchester neighborhoods. So just some quick GIS. Um, we know that the summers are getting hotter in this uh, particular neighborhood and that there is some urban heat island effect and what you don't see in this map as well, there is also combined um, sewer overflow events during storm surges. This is a little bit of an overview of what's going on in the neighborhood. Um, so the parks that are already there are mostly associated with schools. And then there's Franklin Park, which is a large city and regional draw. Um, so not a lot of like great neighborhood destinations, but a lot of community um, that's already happening. So there's a library, a senior center right across the street, and then a surprising number of mosques and churches. Just some other observations that we've made, um, that the site is actually between two commercial districts. And then again, that the library is very active and the senior center is very active. And so how can we use those as ways to deepen our outreach and engagement? So the site is about an acre. You can see that there's a big chain link fence. It is like pretty open. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about the historic and cultural ecological context and this site is more of an open footprint than what we typically accept in our office, um, which feels very freeing, but it also has a very deep social memory. So this is the Grove Hall mural project, um, which is, you can see these murals from our site. Um, then there's also the Grove Hall Memory Project, which is housed in the library across the street. 
and that is a series of photographs and interviews that catalogs what the late 20th century experience was like for Grove Hall residents. Um, there's lots of community organizations. And what we realized is that this project actually started five years ago and that the community organized with Trust for Public Land to decide for themselves that they wanted a park, not more parking. So I tried to think about what the push and pull was between in-person engagement and remote engagement and kind of show you how it's been changing very rapidly over the last 18 months. And so pre-COVID, you know, typically a milestone was that we would get together for a workshop, maybe two or three hours in the evening on a weekday. And then there would be a survey um, that would be email blasted out and you could fill that out on your own time. Then COVID happens and we all go into quarantine. No one's meeting in person and Zoom webinars go way up and we do Zoom webinars and um, surveys that you can do on your own time. And at first there was a lot of enthusiasm for that and then everyone got really Zoom tired. Um, and these sort of big webinars, the irony of talking about breaking the Zoom barrier is not lost on me talking about it on a Zoom webinar with everyone and I can't see you and you <laughs> can't talk to me. And uh, the ir irony is high on this one. But now we're in 2021 and we're getting vaccinated. Boston is entering their next phase of reopening, which means that 150 people can um, come together and gather outside um, with social distancing, but comfort levels are you know, kind of all across the spectrum. And even though the city is reopening, there's a lot of people who aren't um, totally comfortable with meeting. And so we need to think about what are those workshop techniques that we used to have pre-COVID and how do we uh, retrofit them to be more comfortable? So a two hour workshop on a Wednesday evening, we can't really do that anymore. Um, those workshops need to be more like six hours on a Saturday so you can come and go at your leisure, but you still get that in-person touch point. And then at the same time, we still need to do digital um, engagement. So still need to think about, all right, the Zoom webinar isn't giving us deep conversation. We're actually just getting superficial comments. And how do we, um, how do we get that deep conversation um, through the screen? So one of the things that we want to do and are planning to do with the Trust for Public Land um, and the various community partners is to think about how we can actually program this site over the summer um, so that people can start to use the site um, and actually start to think about it as a public space. So maybe the library wants to do an outdoor library event for a week, that's great. We'll have engagement as part of that, but not the main driver. So the main driver for why you would come to the site, why you would do an in-person um, moment is actually driven by the community um, and by the programming that's already in the neighborhood and then engagement just happens to be there. Uh, it's like an easy add-on, it's like the bonus round. So we're working with a community advisory group to help us um, be really specific with what those um, events are going to be and how we're going to time them over the course of the summer. Um, and then kind of thinking about engagement through three big buckets, learning, uh, living, and love. And uh, love is kind of that nod to the sort of very surprising number of churches that are right there. So we have three themes to our engagement. Um, what is your memory? What is your story about this place, about the neighborhood? Um, kind of the next version of the Grove Hall Memory Project. It's the, it's the post-COVID um, question. It's the physical space. How do you feel in the space? What do you want the space to feel like and your vision? Uh, what, do you, what do you want the future story to be? What is your wish for this park? And using those three themes to then set the foundation for design options and refinement. So it's a little bit of a longer process. It's a little bit more um, of a meandering conversation and the city is okay with that, especially 
um, since it's been five years in the running. So just a summary of those principles of engagement that you create tactile and immediate feedback loops um, within each checkpoint. So um, you're not just looking at a screen and then logging off, that there's something more that resonates with you, um, that there's language support, um, that we're offering more than one way to participate and that you can participate off hours. So, right, how do we catch the young families who have evening routines? Um, that there's an incentive to come back, that we are as deep as possible in terms of the number of people that we're reaching, the types of conversations we're having, and that we're building on the existing relationships um, and the existing conversations that have happened over the last five years. So these are just some examples of um, what we're talking about, what we're thinking of doing. So um, one idea is to do a postcard campaign. So as part of book pickup, um, you know, when you go to the library, you get book pickup at Boston, they give you a little receipt that goes into each book that says that you have reserved that book. Um, so why don't you also get a postcard that asks you a quick question or two? Um, the Senior Center also does a meal delivery program for seniors who don't feel comfortable leaving their homes. Um, so adding the postcard is part of that. And then having community drop boxes uh, throughout the neighborhood, you can just drop off your postcard like you're going to the mailbox type of thing. And then how can we use that content to then create a community mural along the fence? Um, and how can we create a sense of togetherness without actually being together? Um, we talked about how we have those deeper conversations on Zoom. So this is Providence Wayfinding. And over the summer, we specifically capped our Zoom meetings at 15 people so we can all see each other. Um, and then we led uh, these sort of mental mapping exercises where we asked people who were on the meeting to sketch and draw for us without a base map so they weren't sort of confined to place. And then we they physically old school just put it up to the camera and start talking about it. Um, but it was a way for us to start to have the conversations that expanded beyond the yes, no question or the poll question, multiple choice, that type of thing. Um, and it really led us to um, be able to build like you know, stronger relationships. Um, this is a play on a comment board. So, you know, one big sentence McLaren Park is, um, but again, how can we start to engage that fence so the fence itself is not a barrier? We are working with Kleinfelder. This picture is obviously pre-COVID um, based on the lack of masks, but one idea that we had was how can we create models that help to illustrate really abstract concepts such as urban heat island effect and uh, combined overflow um, and can we use these models and actually um, put them in the senior center or put them in the library and staff them over the course of a, you know, two a morning or a four hour period and let people come in at their leisure, have an engagement that lasts about 10 minutes and leave. And yet they still feel like, um, you know, they're in a safe environment and they're not in a place where there are, um, you know, it's a public health issue. How can we speak and communicate mostly through photos and through graphics rather than through our words? Um, and then this is an image in San Francisco Chinatown. Over 50% of the kids did not speak English at all. And so you can see that all of our boards and our presentation is done in English and in Chinese. And we communicated almost exclusively through red and green dots. Um, and there were other ways that we communicated, but that was the way that they were able to interact with us. And then we also tested everything out through VR. Um, so again, it's like, we're not narrating, we're not telling you what it is, um, but hopefully, you know, you can try to see it for yourself. And then this is Grand Junction, which is a multi-use path between Somerville and Cambridge. Pre-COVID, we, again, we would do these workshops at night and we got great feedback. We got these good conversations, but we didn't get a lot of people um, who were coming in 
And so during COVID, we hosted a virtual open house on story maps. And we were able to get over 1300 people visited the site. Um, and you can see like 1700 were page views. So there's like, you know, an additional number of people who were just flipping through, but not actually giving us input. Um, but a significant number of people gave us meaningful input on a virtual open house platform. And then we followed that up with 30 minute Zoom sessions that were more like office hours. So you could pop in at 12 on a weekday, 6 p.m. on a weekday, and then we had another one on a weekend and you can just pop in and have a conversation with us. Um, and it totally changed the way this project is going to move forward um, even post COVID. So kind of where we are now is we're setting up our summer schedule and we're setting up what those events are going to be that the library and the senior center want to do. We're working with a community advisory group to set that up and then um, crafting the engage engagement around that. So it's more of that bonus round um, idea. So that's Grove Hall. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that Elaine, you can share. Okay. So I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about me. <laughs> and I'm going to, I tried to find different aspects of my life story that I think relate to my perspective on engagement and things that have shaped how I approach engagement as a planner. Um, and as I'm describing this, I would encourage you to reflect on what are the things in your life that you feel like, you know, shapes your design perspective or your perspective on how you might approach design process. Um, not necessarily about learning about my, my life details specifically, but I'm hoping that it can be an example of how you might look back and, and sort of pull on the threads um, that influence uh, your work now. So a little bit about me. I am the daughter of two political activists and immigrants. Um, the picture on the left are my parents soon after their engagement um, and right before they moved to uh, Buffalo, New York, actually. Um, and then I am what I would call a 1.5 generation immigrant. So I was born in Brooklyn when my parents were there. We actually moved to Seoul, Korea when I was six months old. And then we moved back to the US to California when I was around six. Um, and I think that's something that's really stuck with me is um, my parents sort of deep sort of skepticism and sort of eyes wide open <laughs> approach to um, sort of US culture, but also sort of this delight in exploring a new place. And I think that's something that they've really passed on to my sister and I. Um, so growing up in Cerritos, which is a suburb of LA County, um, I think that sort of California culture really shapes how I approach conversation with communities as well. Um, one thing that was funny when I moved to Boston is I would walk past strangers on the street and say hi and everyone would stare at me like I was crazy or trying to <laughs> get something from them um, and realize that that is a different aspect of California culture compared to New England. Uh, I think we Californians have sunnier weather so we're not as much uh, in a hurry to get where we're going. I can take the time to say hi to people on the sidewalk. Um, and I also grew up in a really multilingual, multicultural context in that specific sort of predominantly Asian American suburb. Um, you're probably wondering why I have a pic blurry picture of two gnomes playing cards. <laughs> um, and in sort of my high school and college years, I was obsessed with storytelling. So my dream, like many Californian teenagers, was to become a movie director and writer. And so that was sort of the thing that I explored before I discovered planning is how do I tell stories? How do I convey emotion um, and tell something whimsical um, in a way that's universally relatable? Um, this terrible movie is buried on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> I should probably take it off. 
Um, in my college years, I studied sociology um, and graphic design, which I think has really shaped the way I think about planning today. Um, this particular French sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu, has this phrase called sociology is a martial art, and it comes in handy um, as a way to kind of capture being able to create an analysis and understanding of the structural system will also will actually allow you allow you to sort of put individual conversations and personal comments into a broader context so that you can understand them better. Um, after college, I worked for an anti-human trafficking organization called Love 136 based out of New Haven, Connecticut. Um, so for a few years, much of my life was standing at a table at different events in different cities across the US, sort of just talking to strangers about anti-trafficking and what people could do. And something that I really learned during that time is this idea of all the little interactions creating this sort of swelling sense of movement um, that movement building or working towards some kind of shared goal doesn't mean that everyone needs to be doing the exact same thing, but finding many different ways to connect to that specific person and what they can do um, so that you kind of create this collective movement towards um, a shared desired change. It also kind of forced me to learn how to just talk to strangers and invite people over to the table. Um, Following that experience, I studied planning at MIT, um, where one of the kind of most joyful experiences coming out of that and something that's really stuck with me is working with people of many different perspectives um, as part of a creative process. Um, with a planning program, people are coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. So there's architects and designers um, that are moving into planning, but also people who were working in housing or engineering or um, nonprofit organizing. And so as we sort of all came together to, to learn about this physical planning and, and design process, um, I think it really forced um, discovering like how different perspectives actually can come together um, to shape a creative idea. So that kind of thinking and experience um, and valuing that experience led me to Sasaki where I work as a planner today. Um, so I'll just give a very brief introduction of the firm. Um, Sasaki is located in Boston, Denver and Shanghai with a majority of the office in um, what will now be downtown Boston office. Um, it's a group of around 300 of us. I think you can also spot Jen in this photo. I'm not sure if you were still there, Jen. <laughs> um, and I have to look way in the back. <laughs> you can also spot Jordan and Dennis who are in the audience. <laughs> um, but it's a firm that's sort of at its core. And the thing that I love the most about it is that it is interdisciplinary. There's you know, architects, landscape architects, planners, engineers, researchers, um, software developers, graphic designers, um, and having all those different kind of perspectives under the same roof, I think is what really shapes um, the philosophy of a lot of the work that we do. So I'm gonna, you know, as a way to illustrate the sort of variety of work that Sasaki does, I'm just gonna share a couple of the projects um, as like a sampling. So Sasaki does big scale um, community master plans. This is one outside of Toronto on a brownfield site. Um, we do um, large scale parks master planning and implementation. For example, this one in near the port of Los Angeles. Uh, we look at resilience in terms of um, planning documents. So doing the research and process to create a holistic game plan, um, in this case for Shelby County. Also looking at resilience in terms of built and implemented landscapes, like this one in Wuhan. Architecture for institutions, like this one in Mexico. Interior design and also research. So this is one, for example, that's um, meant to be a planning resource for librarians, but other research projects that um, have come out of Sasaki is ways to calculate carbon or looking at park access um, and visualizing different factors that affect uh, climate change. 
Um, so I went through that pretty briefly, but Sasaki is actually hosting one of the after bash sessions that will happen on the 22nd of April in a couple of weeks at 1 p.m. Eastern. So be sure to check that out. A couple of my colleagues will be giving a much deeper kind of explanation of the firm and, and um, answering questions there. So a few thoughts on engagement. Um, I know that the title of the talk is talking about engagement alternatives during COVID, um, sort of starting with a note of a humility disclaimer in a way. To me, what I currently feel like is this past year is sort of all of these different experiences piled onto a table and I'm sort of getting into a, a space where I can like clear out a little spot and say, okay, I think I understand a little bit of a pattern over here or a little bit of a pattern over there. So I want to reflect on how, you know, the lessons that the past year has taught me and I think others about engagement for a design process, um, but we're certainly still sort of experiencing the pandemic and I think we'll have you know, much longer lasting uh, lessons and reflections coming out of it. Um, so the first sort of messy pile, sort of little pause point that I've identified is that COVID revealed what was already broken. Um, the most obvious way that COVID has created an additional barrier to engage, engagement is the fact that we couldn't meet as a group, um, which was very frustrating at times, but it also revealed all these other barriers that already existed. Um, we saw how COVID fell into what's unfortunately the same old patterns of compounded effects on certain communities that are already dealing um, with racial disparities in terms of income, housing affordability, health, um, environmental um, health of their neighborhood. Um, and I think it really brought into focus there was a broken cracks in, in, in a lot of American uh, city sort of neighborhood um, systems um, that'll, that, that has revealed barriers that we'll continue to address, we'll continue to have to address in our engagement process, even when we can meet again. I think um, being able to convene, you know, will take away the challenges that we've um, seen in the last year with engagement. Um, yeah, I think it really kind of pointed out the different range of capacity that people have to engage with the design or planning process, you know, in terms of time capacity, um, financial capacity, and even emotional capacity. The second um, sort of overarching idea is one of the things that COVID has actually forced is to me, I think breaking the myth of objectivity and professionalism, I think we've probably all been on Zoom calls where you hear yard work in the background or someone's child screaming and it kind of forces us to understand people as three dimensional um, and that we're whole people <laughs> interacting with whole communities. Um, and and borrowing a phrase from the hindsight conference organizers, you know, what does it mean to practice as a whole person. Um, what you see on the left here um, are some of the things that the community of East Boston is currently dealing with. Um, we're working on a coastal resilience solution project in that neighborhood. And we've had to say, okay, what are the other factors going on here? And, you know, this planning process isn't um, starting fresh, but we have to understand, you know, what has the community already expressed through other planning processes? Um, what does it mean to acknowledge that they're dealing with higher rates of COVID compared to the rest of the city? Um, what does it mean that they're dealing with historic impacts of redlining and um, sort of racially charged disinvestment? Um, what does it mean that they're dealing with a pattern of increasing development over the last five, 10 years? And then the things on the right are things that I was personally trying to process. You know, what does it mean that I've been isolated inside um, trying to understand my role in the uprising and, and understanding um, the sort of the Asian American communities, um, complicity in, in anti-Blackness, which is something I was thinking about a lot this summer. And then also, you know, processing what, is, what does it mean to see all these news stories of people um, who look like me um, being victims of violence. And it's really, I think that 
there's a value in understanding sort of that blurring that the things that are going on externally and the things that you're processing will influence how you approach conversation. And all of that is sort of tied up in how we engage with others, which is community engagement. Um, the third thing is that relationships take work. So I think one of the best ways that we can respect the community that we're reaching out to is to do our homework. Um, so this, all of the things you see around here are um, different research points that we looked at for a big sort of lake park system uh, master plan that's taking off in Baton Rouge. Um, so we're looking at, you know, the historical timeline, what are the different folk stories that sort of shape the culture of that area? What are other planning processes that the community has led? What are planning processes that the city has led? What else has been designed there? What are patterns of displacement and concentrations of low-income residents? Um, what is the art culture telling us? What is public art revealing about how people relate to that place? Um, what you see in that right-hand corner is sort of data coming out of people's Fitbits. What do, what do patterns of where people walk and run reveal about how that space is used? Looking at things like census data, American community survey data, reviews on Google, social media posts, neighborhood forums. Um, I think it's about doing, committing to doing that work and looking at all of the information that's already available so that we can come into the, the conversation about this particular park design with not only sort of a physical site context understanding, but a community context and process context understanding. And then the sort of the last thing is that there's really no magic bullet solution. One small anecdote is that when I worked at the anti-trafficking group, it was kind of when Facebook was really at its height and every group thought, okay, the solution is to create a Facebook for X. And so we spent a lot of time and effort creating a Facebook for people interested in anti-trafficking. And I'm sure you've never heard of it because it was not a long lasting idea. But in terms of, of the objectives of wanting to connect people across cities and communities um, who are dedicated to a shared cause, that's long lasting. And the form of how you meet that goal will continue to change. For example, at the start of COVID, we found that we were getting results to online surveys that were amazing. We got, you know, 300 something people responding to this one in Davenport, for example, because people were sort of at a moment where they had more free time and were in front of their computers and were willing to give responses. But then we used that same exact survey sort of later on in the pandemic and we have gotten very few responses. And I think, you know, people are more tired of using online things. And so we've switched to tactics to say, what, do we, what can we do that actually puts these questions out in physical space? Um, you know, something like a mural board has worked really well for um, an institutional audience, for example, and totally fails with other communities. Um, and one last example in Fort Point, you know, we had sort of a classic open house, actually, I think right at the end of February 2020, um, and looking at who showed up, we found that um, there are a lot of, it was very underrepresented in terms of families of color and, and uh, residents of South Boston. And so we worked with one of the existing community organizations there to host a Zoom call that actually allowed people to participate with their children. Um, and the person that they already knew through that nonprofit was the one that facilitated the conversation in multiple languages and it really led to a fruitful conversation. So all of that to say, you know, don't chase the solution in terms of engagement, um, but really um, the focus is on, you know, how can you reflect on your own practice and experiences and biases and what makes, um, what shapes your perspective in a way that allows you to really identify in a nuanced way what the objective of engaging with that community is for whatever process you're working in. Just as a quick anecdote for Fort Point, I think that Sasaki made like a choose your own adventure um, outreach event for the little kids. And my kid was part of that test group. And so, you know, like a three-year-old was like on the screen being like, ooh, I like that, <laughs> you know? And that was like super fun for him, so. 
Hey, um, thank you so much for an incredible talk, Jennifer and Elaine. And now we will take some questions from um, the participants. The first question is during 2020 Zoom web webinars, how did you reach out to people who may have may not have access to a technology, either due to financial limitations or limited know-how like seniors? So for us, um, both Providence and Cambridge have very high uh, internet literacy. So that was very easy for us. For Grove Hall, where internet literacy is a little bit less consistent, it's um, really through word of mouth and through um, the sort of postcard campaign that we have. And it's not just about postcards that you're getting in the mail, that you're getting the postcards as part of another package that you're expecting. Um, and for us, that seems to be something that the community is interested in, the people like, you know, the, that community advisory group, and then the Trust for Public Land. And so, um, I'm hoping it will work. <laughs> uh, we also have that big fence, right? So that's where this mural is, becomes really important. That's where the sense of creating togetherness without being together becomes important because just that fence alone starts to create awareness about the project. Mm. I think in terms of that second portion of the limited know-how, one thing that we um, kind of going back to that Fort Point example, um, identifying a specific audience and really having a meeting that's meant to talk to that group has um, been really successful compared to trying to have a call that's like reaching as many people as possible. Um, because in partnering with a specific existing nonprofit organization whose leaders have relationships with the families who would be attending, they could actually, you know, talk to them in advance and walk through the Zoom um, instructions in a real personal way. Um, and I think that's what really helped that conversation um, be so fruitful. Right. In Chinatown, where a number, you know, a very high percentage of Chinese people in San Francisco, they when they immigrate, they land in Chinatown and they're there for about a year to 18 months before they move on to another neighborhood. Um, and so there is a very high language barrier in the San Francisco Chinatown. And one of the things that we did is we met with a senior, um, a citizenship class for seniors. And so as part of that class, they were voting and participating in the design process as a way of you know, like flexing their civic muscle. Um, and that was really fun because um, for those particular meetings, we had interpreters who were really great, but the way the teacher was teaching civics was through um, sort of like dance and movement. And so she was communicating mostly through body language. And so we did the same thing and acted out the design with our arms and bodies. Oh, wow. That's really, <laughs> that's really brilliant. That's what I can say. <laughs> <laughs> it was super fun. <laughs> being being an fun. old student of improv, it like really took me back to my improv days. <laughs> okay, we have another one that I, I can personally really um, connect to because uh, it's about Design Connect. Um, Dom asked, Design Connect does really good, great job and is still running strong at Cornell, but it's still an extracurricular and an additive experience that supplements the traditional design education that doesn't put much um, emphasis on engagement. Do you think there are ways to incorporate engagement within design studios, or is it problematic to engage communities just for our own education without much produced besides student designs proposals and designs without funding. So design engagement as part of design studios is really tricky because design studios, at least you know, on the semester program, you've got 12 weeks to do the project. And 
design engagement takes much longer than 12 weeks. Um, and so like, how do you really have an authentic process? And the other thing is that the communities are gonna be there for ever and the students are going to be there for, you know, two to three to four years and then they move on. That was one of the big barriers that we had when we started Design Connect. And so one of the things that we did is we, and I don't think that they do this now, but one of the things that we did in the first um, two or three years is we paired every student group with a professional mentor. So that person was going to help the students um, craft the engagement process and also be part of, um, you know, be a, an available resource for the community after the semester is over. And then also faculty was, was part of that as well. Um, at the time, students also got credit for the work that they were doing. So, you know, I think it's kind of evolved a little bit in how it works now, but mm. that was the intent. I really like that idea of partnering with people or making sure people are involved that will like sort of continue on. I wonder if another aspect of it could be to ask the question of like, what can design studios offer to the community in that shorter time period of connecting? Um, that can be a long lasting resource or something that adds to like building up the capacity of that community to voice their opinions in future processes. Um, whether, you know, that could be something like creating a mapping in a, in a form that can be passed on to a community member to continue to update or creating something visual. Um, but the Center for Urban Pedagogy out of New York does some incredible work expressing you know, what can be really opaque <laughs> um, planning processes um, in a way that's really friendly so that you really empower community members with the knowledge of how does, you know, the housing process work or how does the process of like, final design approval for a park work um, so that it, um, it actually enables people to be able to um, participate in projects that may not be um, related to a student's studio. I think we can, we can take another few questions. Um, Alexis asked, are there things you have found with this new form of community engagement that you think you'll continue to implement even after the pandemic ends? Well, we're certainly not going to do one hour or two hour workshops on Wednesday evenings. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that it's going to be something that is going to, um, you know, be on the weekends and be open for much longer periods of time, right? So we're not getting 100 people in a room and we're doing a presentation and then a couple of exercises. It's going to be something more or the information is provided ahead of time and then you come to the exercise or you come um, and you get the information asynchronously, asynchronously at that point and then do the exercise. Um, it's gonna be le much less lecture format. Mm. Yeah, I agree with the asynchronous thing. Um, <laughs> something that I have uh, been observing in terms of not engagement in terms of a design project, but in terms of how cities have figured out how to engage with the community in getting out critical information and updates about COVID are things that we can also learn from. Um, you know, when there was something where people like people needed to get the word out in a really quick turnaround in multiple languages and different locations where it was something that everyone could agree everyone needed to know about like it's really fascinating to see that city infrastructure and community infrastructure sort of create itself over the last year like everywhere you walk around in boston you see like different signs talking about distancing and information about like health health clinics and all this stuff and i think we can sort of borrow some of that thinking when we you know, are in a place of saying there's a neighborhood plan. Like, if we could get into that same mindset of like a neighborhood plan is something that affects everyone, and we accept that it's like a critical piece of information that needs to get to every audience, then like having it be multilingual and paper and digital, that's not stuff that's 
like can be um, sacrificed because it's too inconvenient or costs too much. But I think um, there's a lot of lessons you can learn in terms of how COVID information was distributed um, that we can apply to uh, projects in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think information is getting much more succinct too, right? At that, um, you know, one of the things that we had thought about for one of our projects was to do a series of one minute Instagram stories as a way of getting base context information out and kind of leading, asking people to do sort of self-led, self-guided tours of a site um, and not, having a real presentation, but using sort of Instagram and social media, again, the audience was much more um, sort of internet savvy, but, um, you know, really condensing that information. So it's never a 60 minute Zoom meeting. We're really anti-Zoom here. <laughs> We're like really trying ways to make it really a different type of experience. <laughs> And we're still using Zoom for this webinar. <laughs> I know, the irony is, is very, you know. Yeah, um, I think we can squeeze in another question. Um, Nicole asked, while we are starting the transition out of completely online interactions, as you mentioned, many people are not still not comfortable with in-person events and many are experiencing online fatigue. How do you suggest combating online survey, online interaction, uh, Zoom exhaustion in terms of community engagement? Um, I think it's, you know, trying to, it, it's about engagement is not like the only thing that you're doing. You know, you, people are going to leave to hopefully, I, I mean, we go to the library, the library has been safe. Um, for us, but it's like, you know, what are the reasons why you would leave your house, why you would feel comfortable leaving your house, and what are, what is the, at, what's the bonus round that you can do with that? Mm. I think something, I mean, this is true of non-online forms of engagement as well, but I think it's especially true of online because there's such a fatigue with it, is how can you frame the question that you're asking in a way that acknowledges what's already been done by the community member, um, saying, you know, in previous processes, we've learned X, Y, and Z. And like, we're asking you this question, which will affect the, the project in X, Y, Z way, and really being able to articulate like what the impact of their feedback is going to be, um, I think can really help reduce that barrier. Again, like for any, any engagement style, but especially for online, when you can prove, um, sort of proving that you are listening and have listened um, before. Yeah, you know, like when we are in school, you know, we all have that teacher who within the first half an hour of the first day of class knows everyone's name and can like sort of relate the content back to that student. Um, and so how can we do that in Zoom? And so it's also about limiting the size. So it's more of that 15 person range where we can all see each other and we can, um, you know, sort of mimic those in-person conversations where I hear you, Cynthia, and I, um, you know, I know that you are an MLA student and I'm going to sort of relate the content back to how your background is, you know, what is interesting to you. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so uh, we will end here for accommodate the next sessions. But thank you so much again for like giving us this incredible talk, Jennifer and Elaine. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference.